Okay, now that we have our base geometry blocked in and exported into CryEngine, it's time to start making some of our tiling textures and materials. I'm going to start with the hexagonal roof tiles seen here. For this texture, I'm going to take one of ZBrush's most annoying features and use it to my advantage. I've first seen this process used in the Uncharted game series, and it produces some stunning tiling textures. So here we are in ZBrush, and I'm sure anyone that's messed around with this program knows that it's very easy to accidentally burn flattened copies of your mesh into your workspace, like this. Now I think this is the single biggest reason people get turned off by ZBrush and frustrated. Essentially, any time you drag out your Z tool, you have to press the T key to toggle on edit mode. If you don't do this, it will continuously drag pieces of your model on the screen. If this ever happens to you by mistake, you can simply press Ctrl N to, con to clear the canvas and then redraw your Z tool onto the workspace. Once it's there, you have to remember to click T again to resume sculpting. The reason this is relevant is because this annoying feature has a secret gift for you in the form of the tilde key. For those of you that think I just made that up, I promise you it's real and it can be found to the left of the one key on most non-gamer modified keyboards. Now this magic key, once pressed, lets you pan your canvas around which automatically tiles your burnt in geometry. This allows us to place a series of repeating pieces and then use tilde to pan the canvas and then fill the gaps in. Once you fill the entire texture, you will apply a nifty normal map material to the scene and then export the texture. So that's the general game plan for right now. So let's jump into Max and prepare a single roof tile so that we can place it with this method. So here I have some of the high poly geometry I used for the window hatch. And I can reuse some of these details if need be. Now, I'll quickly model a clean high poly shingle piece, starting with a six-sided cylinder. I'm going to use quad chamfer, which will give me some nice clean supporting edges for when I subdivide this piece later. Quad chamfer is an external plugin that allows you to add supporting geometry to edges while still keeping the edge loops clean. I recommend looking into it if you do a lot of sub-D modeling. Next, I'll grab some floating bolts from the hatch window and have them hovering above the shingle. Remember, this is all going to become a flat texture, so it doesn't matter that these pieces are floating above. I'll also repurpose a few more of these hatch pieces and position these as sort of a hinge system that these shingles snap together with. Next, I'll add a few more minor details and more edge loops to the face so that it subdivides cleanly. I'll also warp it slightly with an FFD and rotate it so that they stack on each other nicely. Next, I'll copy a few around just to get an idea of how it's going to look as a full texture. Now, we could just export an OBJ of this and start the ZBrush phase, which would give us a perfectly fine tiling texture and normal map, but we wouldn't have much to find for the diffuse texture. This would be especially inconvenient since each shingle has a couple different material elements. For instance, if we wanted the screws to be silver and the hinge to be brass, we would have to spend quite a while hand masking those elements in Photoshop. So instead, what we can do is create a temporary diffuse texture for one of these roof tiles and then apply it in ZBrush so that we already start with the basic colors and material separations in place. To do this, let's just select the shingle and max and apply an unwrapped UVW modifier to it. Now, since this texture is only going to be used temporarily, the layout and size aren't as important. I can just click the edit button to bring up our edit UVs window and then switch to face mode and hit control A to select all. Now since this is relatively flat piece of geometry, I will just do a quick planar map to get a general projection UV from the top. This will work fine since this will only be viewed from one angle anyway. If you anticipate using this piece from multiple angles, then you would spend more time and do a proper unwrap. Next I'll use the free form gizmo to position the, the UVs a little bit better. Finally, I'll go into the Tools menu and choose Render UVW Template, and this will give me an image file of my UVs at the size I specify. I'll leave it at 1024 and click the Render button at the bottom. Next, I'll just save this by clicking the yellow disk in the corner and specify which file type and where I want to save it. For me, I'll just save it as a TIFF, but as long as it opens up in Photoshop, you can choose any file type you like. So here are the UVs in Photoshop. Now I can just overlay some basic metals and other textures over the UVs. One trick that's helpful is to keep your UV layer on top and set the layer mode to screen. 
this superimposes it over all the metal details and any textures underneath. Now I'm going to make some quick masks so that the metal elements can be selected easily. I'll do this by using the polygonal lasso tool. Once I have some basic materials blocked in, I can add some grime buildup around the bolts so they seem weathered. Then I'll save this as a PSD. ZBrush actually lets you load these easily, so it's convenient. Now I'm going to go back into Max and create a basic diffuse material just to double check that the textures line up okay. I'm going to go back and paint a little edge wear on the texture so that we don't have to do this on every tile later on. I'll save it again and check it in Max. So this is looking pretty good, but I think I'll get rid of some of these splotches here because they'll probably look too repetitious when this thing is placed 100 plus times in ZBrush. Alright, now this seems much more usable. I'm ready to export a piece, so I'll select it and make sure it's in the center of our scene. Next, I'll go to the ribbon and choose Export Selected and choose OBJ Format. Now, I'm also going to export a cluster of these to make the placement quicker and fill up more space in ZBrush. I'll just make a series of copies in Max and quickly test out their modularity, and once I'm happy with how they connect, I can export this whole selection. So, to summarize, I have one single tile OBJ, one cluster of tiles OBJ, and a 1024 PSD placeholder texture. Now, we're ready to go over to ZBrush. First, I'll press comma to hide our lightbox menu. Now, this next step is extremely important. We need to make sure our document size is set to be square and preferably a power of two, so it easily works within the game engines. To do this, go into the Document tab and click the Pro button so that it is no longer orange. This constrains proportions and, if left on, will never let you change to a square document size. Once Pro is turned off, go ahead and enter 2048 in both the width and the height fields and make sure to press Enter after each so that it sticks. Finally, click the Resize button for your changes to take effect. Now since we chose 2048, most current monitors don't have that high of resolutions, so we'll have to use the Zoom Document button up here so that it, we can see the entire workspace. Think of these border edges as the edge of your texture. Next we want to get rid of this annoying gradient background. So to do this we can click the color menu and I'm going to choose a darker gray and then I'll jump over to the document tab and drag the range slider all the way to the left. This controls the range of the background gradient so by dragging it to zero it essentially removes it. I've also prepared a guide grid in Photoshop and saved it as a PSD. This will help me keep scale and judge the spacing once I start placing the roof tiles. To get the grid image into our background, let's first change our material here to flat color so that the grid shows up with its local value. Now, just go to the document tab and click import to bring in the grid PSD. Next, we want our roof tiles to be placed on a separate layer so that we can delete the grid background when we are done. To do this, go into the layer menu and click create, and then select the new layer. Now everything you place into the canvas will be on this new layer. Now we have our document set up correctly, so let's click Save As and call it something like Tile Test. Next, we need to import our first OBJ and apply the texture we've created. Go into your tool menu, click Import, and then navigate to wherever you exported the OBJs from Max. Once loaded, you will click and drag out the model into your scene and press T to switch to the edit mode. Next, click on the Texture tab on the left side here, and then import your PSD. Open the Texture tab again, and choose a PSD so that it is selected. Now go over to the Texture Map menu on the right side and select the blank square. You should see your texture in this menu, so select it, and it should automatically apply to your object. Now there's a weird mapping glitch where it comes in upside down, so if we expand the UV Map menu, click the Adjust button, and then choose Flip V, and it should display correctly. Next, you'll notice that the texture is visible, but it's also blending with whatever material you had already had selected. If you want this to be a clean, diffuse texture, we can select the Material menu and choose Flat Color. Now we won't have any other shading interfering with our local colors of this object. Now I'm going to go with Matte Cap Green Rama, because it still shades pretty flat, but it has a little bit more definition. So this piece is ready to be placed, but we want to also set up the multi-shingle piece with the texture. Make sure you have imported this as a separate Z-tool so that you can choose between them as you're placing them down onto the canvas. Now that I have both pieces prepped, I'll actually use the camera controls to position this piece where I want it on the texture. 
Remember, as you're rotating your ZBrush camera, if you hold shift, it will snap to the closest straight view. This comes in really handy for the placement of these pieces. This takes a few times to wrap your mind around it, but after a few textures, it'll start to feel normal. Well, as normal as possible for ZBrush anyway. Once I'm ready to place another piece, I'll press T, which toggles off edit mode, and then I'll drag out the Z tool again and press T to go back into edit mode and adjust the camera. Remember, this is the weird process where the previous mesh becomes burnt into your workspace, and then you just use the camera controls again to line up the next piece. It's best to think of the sequence like this. Click and drag out a piece, press T, position it with the camera, press T, then rinse and repeat. If you misplace any, you can just simply undo any placements that you do not like and do it again. Now, here's a warning. Before we start the placement phase, let's double check a few things. Number one, we need to make sure our document is square. Remember, preferably 2048 or 1024. I chose 2048 so that when I shrink it down later to a 1024, it'll be nice and crisp and have good quality to it. Number two, we have two layers, one for the grid and one for the roof tiles. Number three, we have all the subtools loaded and the textures are ready to go. All right, now I'll place a few of these big clusters in the center. I'm using the grid to get an idea of spacing. I think I'll try and keep each tile roughly the size of a grid space for consistency. Once I have the middle space filled up, I'll press and hold the magic tilde key that I mentioned earlier, and I'll drag off to the side of the canvas to offset the texture. Notice how it magically wraps around and creates a seamless texture. This only works if you keep your current draw object away from the edges. So now, I'll try and cover as much space with the larger piece here. Some of the sizes are a little different, but I'm okay with it as long as it's not too drastic. I'd rather have some abnormalities and angle changes in this as opposed to a perfect placement where all the cracks and gaps are the exact same size. That would actually look less natural. Come to think of it, this is probably why I didn't do well back in high school when I took a summer job as a roofer. Now I have a few more gaps to fill, so I'm going to switch over to the single piece that I exported. And if you ever want to control the depth of your last placed piece, you can switch over to the Move tool and drag up or down off to the side of the canvas to raise and lower it. Thanks, Noah, for the tip. You can also use the Rotate tool to give things a slight angle. Remember, this is only if you're in draw mode, and it's only on your last placed piece, so it's a little bit specific. As you can see, the last few tiles can take a little finessing, but it shouldn't be too bad. I could have made the grid texture actual hexagons so that things lined up perfectly, but this will work fine for now. I'll drag the texture with tilde one last time to make sure there are no seams. Now it's time to delete the background grid by going into layers, selecting it, and hitting clear. This is also a good time to save since we will be exporting out a diffuse, normal, and alpha soon, and we wouldn't want to accidentally nudge the canvas or offset things midway through that process. I'm going to go into the Render tab now and make sure Shadows and A Occlusion or Ambient Occlusion are turned on, and then I'll click the Best button so that it renders at the highest quality. Now, depending on your texture, you might not want this much shading information, but for mine, I like the subtle shadow, and it provides a nice layering effect, which breaks it up and adds a little more depth. Once it's finished, go to your Document tab and just export this out as a PSD. Now here it is in Photoshop, and you can see how much detail and resolution we have already, which is why it was worth setting up the temporary diffuse texture earlier. Now imagine if we hadn't done that, we'd be going through and masking off each one of these little bolts and everything, and it would take quite a while. Now let's apply the normal map material. This is another weird little trick where you click any Z tool over here, and then uncheck Z add and any of these other adjacent buttons so that only MRGB is selected. Now, when you click and drag over your texture, you'll notice that it's filling the texture in with the normal map material we've selected, and it's using whichever Z tool you had selected as the brush shape. Do this a couple times and make sure you get the corners filled in completely. Now, let's go back to the render menu, and for the normal map, we actually don't want shadows or A occlusion on, so turn those off. We also want to change the background color so that it is the normal map neutral color. To do this, go into the color menu and manually type 128, 128, 255, and you should get this flat periwinkle color. Now when you go into the document tab, click the BKG or background button to fill in the new color. 
Now let's jump back to the render tab and turn on smooth normals as well as the best option. And we're ready to export the normal map by going into the document window again and hitting export. So here's the normal map in Photoshop. We're going to need to go into the channels tab and invert the green channel so that it's compatible with CryEngine. CryEngine, 3ds Max, and UDK along with Crazy Bump all read normal maps as Y axis being down, while Maya and ZBrush default to Y axis being up. If you ever have your green channel wrong in an engine, it won't be completely obvious, but things will look slightly off and you'll wonder what's going on. For example, here's a basic box with a brick wall normal map applied to it. I haven't flipped the green channel yet, so notice how the vertical highlights are coming from the wrong direction. Now I'll load the normal map after inverting the green channel, which will correct the lighting errors. Here are the two examples again. First the uncorrected normal map, and again the same normal map with the green channel inverted. The best way to test this is to look at your green channel in Photoshop, and the highlights should be hitting from the bottom. So any of the, your geometry that you're looking at here, the highlight should be hitting these bottom beveled edges. The red channel highlight should always come from the right. Now I have a silly little mnemonic device to help remember this. Green grass grows from the bottom and red light comes from the right. So green from the bottom, red from the right. Pretty catchy. Once you select the green channel, you can simply press Control i to invert it and then save your changes. Now I want to test this quickly, so I'll select all by hitting Control A and then Control C to copy it into my clipboard. Next I'll open up Crazy Bump and click the bottom right option, Paste Normal Map from Clipboard, and we should get a spherical preview that pops up. I'll change the preview shape to a box in the bottom right here, and then I can use the plus and minus keys to increase and decrease the tiling amount of this texture. Now this is just so that I can visualize it. It doesn't actually change the layout of the texture. Now we'll do more normal tweaks later, like adding some small micro details and scratches and rust, but for now this will work fine. Lastly, I want to export out a clean alpha so that I can select the gaps between the roof tiles easily in Photoshop. This is similar to what we just did with the normal map material, but this time we want to select flat color and make sure it's set to pure white. Remember that only MRGB should be checked on this group of buttons, and then click and drag the white material over everything. Now you can go change your color to black and click the BKG button under documents and you're ready to export this alpha as a PSD. So here's the alpha in Photoshop. I put it in the alpha channel and I can quickly use this to select those gaps and delete out the unnecessary pixels. Well that wraps up the tiling texture and ZBrush portion of this tutorial. In our next chapter, we're going to look at how to add some rust and weathering in Photoshop and also test the material on the actual mining buildings. Thanks a bunch.